You have a mission, assigned to you by your true people. You will complete it. Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This will be my full Invincible Season 2, Episode 7 video. There were a whole bunch of Easter eggs and references. We finally got Anissa way sooner than I was expecting on the show. She even teased a bunch of big stuff that's going to be coming in Season 3, so we'll talk about that later in the video. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get everything. Robert Kirkman revealed the timeline for Season 3 probably going to release next year. I think they worked ahead a little bit faster this time, so there won't be like a two-year break before we get Season 3 episodes. Careful for spoilers if you haven't seen the episode yet, we'll just start at the beginning, work our way through shot by shot, talking about Easter eggs and the many, many WTF moments. Another will come. He will demonstrate the error of your ways and this whole planet will pay the price. Starting with the episode title, I'm Not Going Anywhere, a reference to basically all the different storylines. Like This episode was the personal trauma PTSD episode. Everybody working through their mental, their emotional trauma with a little bit of physical trauma too. Generally, it's meant to be about everybody working past their trauma to become stronger people. But like the whole idea in the episode is that Invincible needs to get stronger physically, but he also needs to get stronger emotionally too. So they use everybody's storylines for the emotional side of that. Also his breakup with Amber and then the Anissa stuff for the physical side of that. Like physically, you will actually have to get stronger. The opening scene is of Amber and Mark going to their universe's version of San Diego Comic-Con. There's a person cosplaying someone called Grom, who's basically like a parody of Thanos mixed with Galactus and Zod from the Superman comics. Like he's got the purple nutsack chin like Thanos, but his suit looks kind of like Galactus's suit. And he says, all will kneel before Grom, which is a reference to Zod's catchphrase, kneel before Zod. There's a big kaiju poster in the background. A lot of kaiju stuff going on in this episode too, but the poster seems like more of a Godzilla reference because this is Comic-Con. Also a lot of Godzilla stuff happening in real life too, like we had Godzilla minus one and Godzilla and Kong happening in the MonsterVerse. The banner next to that seems like a reference to Cayman Rider. Amber mentions mad scientists and aliens that Mark has been fighting. That's Doc Seismic earlier in the season in the Sequids, which he just fought. They spot a bunch of Invincible cosplayers. This is also a bit of a sly reference to the Invincible War in the Angstrom Levy storyline. They will eventually do a version of the Invincible War, but that's probably not going to happen till later season. Basically, Angstrom Levy going around different universes, collecting a bunch of evil versions of Invincible to bring them back to fight Mark. They give the cosplayers the Invincible title trope this week, letting them set up the payoff. Look out, evil! The logo breaks again, it's almost fully broken now so that even more of the black and blue logo is visible underneath. Pretty easy to predict that it'll break for the final time in the finale. Each episode this season has had a version of this with the logo breaking a little bit more. It's just a reference to his black and blue suit from the comics, but I don't think he's meant to get that till probably season 3. Like they might set it up at the end of the finale though, like I need a new costume, this one's torn to shreds. Inside the convention center, there's a bunch of different cosplayers. Most of them I was able to identify, like this is a Cayman Rider cosplayer. I'm not sure who the space pirate is supposed to be though, that might be Captain Harlock. There's a 13th Doctor here for Doctor Who references. The person behind Amber also looks familiar, but I can't quite place them. There's a couple other people cosplaying around here too that you probably recognize, like this is Naruto. We find out that Mark is a huge comic book collector, which I think he's referenced in previous episodes. Like he has a Sans Dog poster in his dorm, so they're already kind of setting that up. And very apropos, because we're at Comic-Con here, he puts them in a super long line to get an autograph from the author or the artist of Seance Dog, the TV show. And while they're waiting in line, they start to set up the slow death of their relationship, which they basically pay off at the end of the episode, especially after she learns she has to park it in line forever today. Making someone who isn't into this kind of stuff stand in line all day for an autograph is a quick way to kill your relationship. Within the universe, Philip Schaff is just someone that works on the TV show Seance Dog, but it's meant to be a parody of Ryan Otley, who draws the Invincible comic books in real life. He also works on the Invincible TV show. Their whole conversation is meant to be sort of like a meta easter egg for the Invincible show in real life. Like all the references he makes, all the tricks that they pull to save time, save money, all the references to the fans. I gotta ask, when's the new season of Seance Dog coming out? Like Mark asking him when the new season of the Seance Dog TV show is coming out is a reference to all the fans in real life asking Robert Kirkman when the next season of Invincible is coming out. The reason he gives on the show about Seance Dog is the same reason in real life it takes so long to make the Invincible show, just because animation in general takes way longer to make than live action TV. There are a bunch of inside baseball animator jokes too. 
how difficult it is to animate, especially big fight scenes. How the animators try to cut corners by showing different types of shots, like don't show their mouths, don't show them actually talking, just cut to wide shots panning across crowds. This is like the animators on the Invincible TV show winking from behind the camera. I'm gonna watch season two way closer. When Mark tells him he's gonna watch season two way closer, wink wink, that's them calling out the fans in real life of Invincible who are now going to pay way more attention to episodes to try and spot all the tricks that they pull. Like, ah, see, we're gonna be looking way more closely now. Really good example of that is when they say the animators sometimes go off the rails and the show doesn't look like the show is supposed to look and they make Mark look super stylized. Adam Eve calls him asking for his help with Rex who is snuck out on a mission by himself to try and get his groove back. A lot of people trying to get their groove back in this episode. She's busy with Kill Cannon again. This is kind of like a running gag on the show, especially going back to the Adam Eve prequel episode. Like how many more times is she gonna take him down? Another big strike against their relationship or against Mark in their relationship is that he makes her hold all the stuff that he bought while he goes to save Rex. Like, yes, he is a superhero, that's important, but if you really wanted somebody to break up with you, abandon them at a Comic-Con and make them hold all your stuff. I think most people were expecting the breakup at the end of this episode, like they were trying to telegraph it pretty heavy early on in the episode. Elsewhere, Rex is having trouble using his powers after his accident. It's mostly a mental block kind of thing, like he's still got PTSD from what happened. It's kind of like Tobey Maguire during Spider-Man 2. The person he's fighting is called Octoboss, who's kind of like a parody of King Shark, but in-universe, he's meant to be an alien from another planet. He was originally a criminal from another world who was exiled along with the Squid Men, who we see here, into deep space, and then he took control of them, and their ship crashed to Earth, and he started committing crimes. They come back into the story later eventually too, like they eventually try to take over Atlantis, just cause general mayhem, but in the context of this particular adventure when Rex is trying to stop him, they're trying to steal nuclear material. Invincible arrives to help him, they make a Davy Jones reference, and notice Rex Splode also uses one of his new weapons in his cybernetic hand that replaced the missing one, making a Spider-Man thwip motion to activate the hand cannon. A lot of people saw this in the trailer and they're like, does this mean that they're gonna do Spider-Man this season? Josh Keaton was rumored to be playing a character and he voiced Spider-Man in the cartoons. During the original Invincible comic book, there is a very important Spider-Man crossover where Invincible is crossing between universes and crosses into Spider-Man's Marvel Universe essentially, like he goes into the Marvel Universe. The way that Robert Kirkman talked about this though, because a ton of people asked him about Spider-Man showing up, he basically said what you all probably assume, like there's no way the lawyers at Marvel are gonna let them borrow the Spider-Man character, like it would take way too much money. There are a lot of crossovers that happen with Invincible comics and other Image comics because that was the original publisher of the Invincible comics. There are a lot of Walking Dead references on the show too, just because Robert Kirkman created The Walking Dead. But I don't know what the rule is on some of the other comic book crossovers, we'll see. I'm not expecting Spider-Man though. If Josh Keaton is voicing a Spider-type character, it's not gonna be the actual Marvel version of Spider-Man. Really interesting though, like you start to see a lot of Rex Splode's personal growth during this episode where they bond over their shared trauma, with Rex actually being relatively understanding him like he isn't nearly as big a dick as he's been in the past. To make another comic book reference, he marvels at the fact that Invincible can grow new teeth to replace the ones that got knocked out as regular humans cannot. This will also be handy in the future because he gets the crap pounded out of him on the regular throughout the rest of the Invincible comics. He also gives him a bit of a hall pass, like a free day off to spend with his girlfriend Amber at the time, they're still boyfriend and girlfriend, which is a super cool thing for him to do. Monster Girl and Robot have their training session. She gets super frustrated trying to operate one of his robot replacements for her powers. He even made it to resemble her monster form too. They argue more about her not wanting to do things his way, like find a technological workaround, even though he's just trying to help her. We'll see how that plays out. Like there is eventually an answer to that in the comics that you can go read right now. But if you have read the comics ahead, please don't post those spoilers on the video. They also clarify that Shrinking Ray is still fine, but she's gonna be out of commission for a good long while. Probably till season three. Cecil tries to stop the immortal from quitting the Guardians of the Globe because he is about to fly apart at the seams, like he's losing it so much. He settles for a long vacation though, he will also probably be back by the events of season 3. Giving Robot another promotion to team leader, which he was previously. Love the way the Bulletproof also calls out each different team member for all the messed up stuff that each person does, like each person has their own major problem they're dealing with in some different way. Speaking of which, Donald also tries to resign from the Global Defense Agency because he is cracking up so much. 
Cecil explains how he himself, the original version of Donald pre-accident, is the one who set up this whole cyborg replacement body situation and the mind wiping. Like every single time, it's always up to you, we leave it up to you, and you're the person who chooses to have your mind wiped. Super messed up, he shows him how many times it's happened too, like you're the one that wanted to see this, so we'll show you. He watches a bunch of his different deaths, and later in the episode he reveals he's died 39 times, and each time he dies, there's less of him to bring back. So like each time, he becomes more and more cyborg. Now he believes he's up to about 98% cyborg. Then Mark gets called in to see the dean about to get kicked out of college, and it is Carl Winslow, who used to be the principal of his high school he just graduated from at the beginning of the season. Really cool meta easter egg here too, he's played by Reginald Vell Johnson in real life who played Carl Winslow on the show Family Matters and the high school that Mark went to was named Reginald Vell Johnson High School, so talk about meta. He basically just rakes him over the coals the way you would expect for missing so much school and tells him to pick a lane and stay in it, like stay in school, live a normal life, or even though he doesn't know that Mark is invincible, Mark has to choose whether or not he wants to go full-time superhero and just be invincible all of the time. Even if you have not read all the Invincible comics, I think you can guess which way this is going to wind up going before the end of the episode. Like there is so much at stake here with the Viltrumites and everything else that's going on, there is no way he's going to have time to live a normal life and go to school. Back at home, Mark's mom gets her groove back a little bit. Her coworker even asks her out, which she happily agrees to, showing that she's starting to get past her PTSD that went down with Omni-Man last season. Also, fun fact, because there's so many famous people voicing characters on the show, her coworker is played by Cliff Curtis from Fear the Walking Dead, another Robert Kirkman connection between shows and comics. There are a bunch of Walking Dead actors on the show, speaking of which, Steven Yoon, who played Glenn on The Walking Dead. Also reminder here that Oliver's nanny, April, is played by Calista Flockhart. He's gotten even bigger talking more clearly. She also references that he learns way faster too because he's an alien that ages way faster. Most of that part of the conversation, I think, is just to set up the payoff that his powers will probably develop very soon. I'm expecting to see them by the end of the finale, like maybe some surprise twist where they manifest in the finale. That's kind of the way things go down in the comics. There have been a couple changes to the comics in this episode, so I'll point some of them out when we get along, especially when we get to the Anissa stuff. But generally, most of the stuff that's happening now in the next couple of episodes will be pretty close to the comics, with just some of the characters moved around a little bit. His mother talks him through the amber of it all with him, also reminiscing about her time with Omni-Man when she was first going out with him. Most of their talk about how she was super lonely because he was gone all the time is just to help set up the breakup at the end of the episode. Like Mark didn't want to put her through what Omni-Man put his mother through. But during their conversation, she talks about not wanting to take things back. Like if I had to do it again, I still would be with Omni-Man. I still would have eventually given birth to you. Just to help foreshadow her eventually seeing Omni-Man again. Like eventually they will meet each other again. Then Donald helps talk Rick off of a ledge, literally, because Rick's problems are exactly the same thing that Donald just went through, this PTSD that he's trying to deal with. He reveals to him that he is a cyborg, tells him the truth about everything that happened and how he's died 39 times. Donald's whole speech about learning to deal with personal trauma and not trying to just erase, like wipe his mind, like actually learning to grow stronger by dealing with it, is a metaphor for the entire episode and everything that everybody in the episode is trying to do. Like I said, the idea that Invincible needs to get stronger emotionally, like deal with his trauma, but also get stronger physically. Then Invincible cashes in his free day off that Rexplode offered him to go out with Amber, and this whole setup to his first meeting with Anissa plays out a little bit differently from the comics, but it kind of goes down like this in the comics. Originally, I think that he was with his mother when Anissa shows up to interrupt them like this for the first time. But it basically goes down the same way, like this part of the episode with Anissa is very similar to the comics. She tries to remind him about the mission that General Craig put him on, basically taking over Omni-Man's mission to take over the planet and prepare it for Viltrumite rule. And if you couldn't identify her from the voice, she's actually being played by Chantel Van Santen. Some of you might remember her from The Flash, but you also probably remember her more recently from the boys TV show. She plays the Becca character. How ironic that she's playing a very Homelander-like character now, like polar opposite of her boys character, Becca. She is the one terrorizing everyone now. Notice when she grabs Amber's neck, threatening to snap it, is just like the evil Invincible did in episode 1 with his universe's version of Adam Eve. Cecil monitors their meeting, he references the destruction of Chicago during season 1 with his fight in Omni-Man, like they almost leveled the city. 
There's another ironic twist here too when she reveals that humanity only has about an 18% chance of surviving the next few hundred years because humans are so chaotic they're going to destroy themselves all on their own unless Viltrumites take over and save them. And apparently Mark only has an 18% chance of surviving an actual fight with her because she's so much more powerful. If it wasn't clear, in present day, Anissa is meant to be over a thousand years old. She's very, very old, so she's had that much time to train and get more powerful. They even say in the episode that she's faster than Omni-Man. Maybe not stronger than Omni-Man, but definitely faster. Basically, Mark has absolutely no chance against her. And the way she tries to sell him on the Viltrumites taking over the planet, it's a lot like a Thanos type of plan. Like, terrible person says something that's kind of accurate. Like, yes, the humans are probably going to destroy themselves eventually. Then speak of the devil, right after they reference D.A. Sinclair and what he did to Rick earlier in the episode, Cecil calls him inside the GDA asking for his upgraded reanimin that he's been working on since the events of season one, which aren't ready yet. Just a reminder that he's still working on them in a deep dark hole somewhere inside the GDA. The random kaiju showing up and attacking the cruise liner is also from the comics. They use it as a test to make Anissa prove that the Viltrumites don't relish in killing for killing's sake and they actually do want to help planet Earth. They also use this kaiju attack to show you how much stronger she is than Invisible, easily destroying it when Mark had a bunch of trouble. She flies through it like it's tissue paper. Notice the whole time too, like when she's fighting Mark, when she's fighting the kaiju, she never gets out of breath. Like this is all just a casual day for her, like no big deal. They take the wreckage of the cruise ship to a nearby island and remind you about some of the other Viltrumite powers that she has, like super hearing. Mark will eventually develop that himself. But the whole idea is that she's been able to hear everything that Cecil has been saying this whole time. And after he refuses to acquiesce with her, she just absolutely wrecks him, just spanks him up and down the beach. It's a lot like his fight with Omni-Man, like he tries to put up a fight, but it's not even close. Cecil tries to get him to lie, even temporarily, saying that he'll accept the Viltrumite mission, which he declines, like he absolutely refuses each time. Gets another pounding from her, even harder, and even though she's not trying to kill him, just really hurt him, which she does. He even calls her bluff, like, kill me if you want to kill me, but it sounds like you need me, which she does. Part of the reason for that is because Viltrumites are such a precious resource, like they're trying to repopulate their race and they need more Viltrumites to do that. That'll be important for a storyline much later, so like open up a bookmark, like put a pin in that for a while. But the whole idea is that she can't kill him, even though she kind of wants to here. When she says another will be coming and killing him will eventually be his task if he doesn't do what he's told to do, she's talking about Conquest, who we actually saw during the season one flashbacks. My assumption is that Conquest won't show up till like season three. It just feels like it's too big. They just save it for season three. Maybe there'll be another teaser at the very end of this season. And after she heads back to the Viltrumite warship, both he and Cecil agree no more days off from work because now there's a ticking clock on Conquest showing up to kill him and destroy half the planet. Basically making up his mind for him about which path he's going to take in life. Like, okay, I need to be invincible and train full time. RIP to his relationship and RIP to his college degree. And poor Amber here, like you feel kind of bad for her, who did nothing wrong, probably going to have way more PTSD going forward now. They both realize it's time to end their relationship, like it is not going to work. She does not belong in his world. She cannot live in his world, even though she kind of wanted to. Overall, it was a great breakup speech, even if you haven't been a big fan of the character or all the relationship stuff. I feel like Zazie Beetz, great actress, done a lot of superhero stuff in the past too. I don't know what they're going to do with Amber going forward on the show. Like, she's still alive. She's still going to be going to college. But obviously, Invincible has all this other stuff going on. So she's not going to be as big a part of the story if she does come back. But I think part of the idea is that they'll focus more on Invincible's developing relationship with Adam Eve, who is very much a part of this quote-unquote superhero world during Season 3. But it'll mostly be a Season 3 thing. And just as he's crying his eyes out about the breakup on top of the school, Angstrom Levy returns using his mother's phone to call him out, holding them hostage. This scene is also right out of the comics too, setting up their next big rematch in the finale next week. Then like most of the episodes this season, they have a post credit scene. During it, Anissa returns to their warship with General Craig and tells him what happened. And Alan the alien passes by just like checking out his phone, like not paying attention at all. Weirdly misses the Viltrumite ship. Like how could he miss that? It seems like he's on his way to search for all the different weapons and people inside Omni-Man's books that can help them fight the Viltrumites. He uses the fight with Anissa to test out his enhanced strength and is able to make her bleed, just showing how much stronger he's gotten now. Like, he can't beat her in a one-on-one -on -one fight, but he can hold his own much longer against her now. 
The real big surprise though is that he actually throws the fight and makes her think that she knocked him out so that she will take him to the Viltrumite prison because he knows that Omni-Man is there and he wants Omni-Man's help with Thetis' plan to fight the Viltrumites. So this is just a really easy way to infiltrate the Viltrumite prison to get close to Omni-Man so that they can team up and break out. There also might be a couple other big surprise characters inside that Viltrumite prison. We'll see. If you haven't read the comics, it's all out there right now, but it's basically an arc that's right out of the comics. They could either have their prison break at the end of the finale, or they could wait till season three for that. Like, it could go either way. But it was a great episode, one of my favorite ones from season two so far. We'll see if they can top it for the finale. Like, can they land this bird? We already know they're doing season three. Like I said, probably gonna happen next year, so I'm expecting a huge WTF cliffhanger too. If there's any other Easter eggs or references that you spotted in the episode that I didn't talk about in the video, just write them below in the comments. We'll be talking a lot about Anissa in the future. This is just the first time that she shows up on the TV show. She gets up to some really, really messed up stuff in future story arcs. My full Invincible Season 2 Episode 8 finale video will post next week after they release it, and then hopefully they'll give us some more information about when Season 3 is actually going to air. The other big reminder, we're in the middle of X-Men episodes. My X-Men episode 4 video will also post next week too. Everybody click here for all those new X-Men episodes and click here for all my Invincible episodes. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one.